Okay, here we are, back in Kerbal Space Program after many years. Booted it up a week ago and found out that my KOS scripting for autopilots from five years ago was still working. And looked at it and realized that there was a whole lot of places in my code that I'd written for KOS that said, if I were to do this all over again, I would do these things differently. And I kind of scratched my head and I thought, you know, it's been five years. Why don't I do that? So I actually got a, a decent flight out of the old microcode. I plopped it into a, one of the stock uh, vessels and fired it off and it got into orbit and everything. So I know that I've got some Kerbal scripting that can do things like do an ascent path and get into orbit and all of that. But I'm going to start over from scratch, tabula rasa and start off with building uh, an actual uh, flight control software system. Starting with good solid foundation as a module manager so the software can pull in modules and use them in nice robust ways. Uh, I will try to build a framework so that you can say I want to do these mission steps and have the steps themselves be globally available to all the missions. For instance, if you want to circularize, you just say, I want to circularize. And that has to be combined with a phasing system so that if at any time it reboots, it can come back and start over at the beginning of the current phase. So if you're circularizing and you lose power, when you come back, you'll pick back up and it'll say, oh, I was circularizing it. It will continue onward with the circularization process and so on. So that's long-term plans. <clears throat> so as I say here in my README file, uh, I'm trying to avoid inheriting old mistakes. So one of the mistakes was trying to minify my software, trying to write my Kerbal script and have it be as small as possible. It's made it almost impossible to read because you compress out all the white space and all your variables are one letter long and yuck. So, my mantra this time is going to be use readable names, use good software engineering practices to, make, to write maintainable source code, and then use the, the KSP compiler to convert it to KSM files, which are smaller. So instead of doing this old style, you know, copy from archive and run, Instead, I'm going to do a compile on the archive, back into the archive, copy the KSM file and run it. I believe this copies the KSM file. If not, we'll just tuck the KSM in. I do know that run path will look for a .ksm file and then look for a .ks file if you don't put an extension on it. So this this last part is good. It's this one I'm, I'm not quite sure of, but we're about to test that. Uh, the first thing we want to do is build our module system. Now, you notice that I've got Kerbal Space Program going over here. This is an absolutely fresh image. I've just started a, a new career in Kerbal Space Program. <clears throat> it has been modified. I have uh, some light modifications going in. I've, I've got, it makes it look better. I've got KOS turned on. And I also have a configuration file that makes the a KOS processor present in all of the command cores. So all of the pods that can take Kerbals and be a command core and all of the unmanned stuff, they all have them. And those have 100 megabytes of storage. I don't believe this modifies the amount of storage on the actual KOS modules. So what we're going to do is we're going to use those 100 megabyte modules during our development phases. But if I can get my comp my compilation to work right here, if this, if this trick works like I hope it does, then I should be able to take my fairly large source files, compile them down, which gets rid of all the white space and, and all the comments and all the long names and turns it into an actual binary. Hopefully those should be small enough to fit on the somewhat smaller storage that's available. And at that point it becomes a, a uh, constraint. And I'll look at doing things like, well, how can I change my design so that I use less storage? But at least during initial development, we'll go ahead and have the large, larger stories, our storage. So, what do we need here? 
we need a we need a boot file um, and the boot file needs to do a couple of things when it starts off let's switch over to it lazy globals need to be off uh, that's back in the old original days you could read a variable and if it didn't exist it would be lazy it would just create it in the global namespace and give you back a default value we don't want that because that means typos turn into just getting the wrong value. So we turn that off. And this has been a mandatory part of every Kerbal script, everybody I know, for seven years. Anyway, a long, long time. Second thing is, uh, the player input throttle defaults to 50%, or it did. Uh, I believe this was... Uh, changed and it's no longer necessary so I'm actually going to get rid of that you can see I copied this file from a for a development area um, I like to wait a little bit after we uh, after we get the the craft booted before we start actually running the software that allows it to stabilize allows the physics engine to come to stability and all of that <clears throat> now if we are at home I'm going to want to load up the library, which means that if there's a fresh copy of the library on the archive, I want a copy of it. So, for connected, update my copy of farcos.ksm. We're going to compile it to KSM from KS, and we're going to copy it locally. Now, there's a chance that we're not connected. So if we're not connected, we hope that farcos is still there. If it's there, then we can go ahead and do a run path on it. This should run our Farcos, which is a, a library. It will provide a few things for us. A very few things. It needs to be very small. It's going to be present on every craft. And this is what I want it to look like for running. I want to import a package called Go, and I want to run the method called Go inside the package. This is kind of my state, my stake in the ground of what I want it to look like. So all of our vehicles will provide that same thing. This boot KS, I don't want to change it very often. Uh, if I'm lucky, this will be the final version. If I'm not lucky, we'll be editing it like crazy. So this requires two things. It requires a Farcos file, and it's going to have a Go module that it's going to want to pick up. So let's grab Farcos. Here's Farcos. Well, first of all, what are our requirements for it? We've got our bootstrap. It's going to pull this stuff in. It's going to start things going. We know that's there. And we think it's going to work, and we'll find out when we run it the first time. But it's trivial, so I'm not going to stop right now to do it. I'm going to go on ahead with this, stage one. Uh, we want a module system. When you load a module, I want it to give you back a object that you can use to obtain services from the module and the best data structure I've seen in KOS for that is a lexicon which maps a string onto an arbitrary object and very often those arbitrary objects are going to be function delegates uh, C programmers will think of function pointers and virtual you know C++ programmers talk about virtual functions and so on but the important thing is that I can export from a package, I can say, well, I want to look at some data from it, so I can reference this suffix member and fetch its value. I can call a method and have it return a value to me. I can call a method that doesn't return a value. You can have parameters in here, so I can pass that back in, and so on. So this is how I want to use it. So what does import need to do? There's our requirements needs to be import in the global namespace so here it is global import uh, I'm using some tricks here let's go over the requirements first and then I'll start on the tricks it needs to return a lexicon which we mentioned and oh, excuse me this is the other lexicon I want the function import to be idempotent. So if you import a module and then somebody else imports it, they should just simply get back the same module object. We shouldn't 
reload it. We shouldn't update it. We shouldn't re-execute its initializer. We just get it back. So we need a lexicon local to import, which says this mod for this module return this, and for that module return that. So if it's not there, then we do a couple things. First of all, we update the module source from the archive. So we find the module source in the archive. We're importing it. We find the source in the archive and we compile it and we copy it onto the spacecraft. Now, in a real flight software system, you would already have it compiled, but the compiler has to run from within KOS and I don't have make. I don't have any dependency stuff. So either we run it or we don't. And unless I want to run a special test craft that all it does is compile KS files, we'll just make this part of the load. So we're going to find the source file and compile it to, K to, K to the uh, compiled form. Copy it onto the vessel and run it. The reason why we copy it onto the vessel is because we may reboot when we don't have a connection and we want to be able to find a reasonably recent version on the vessel rather than go back out to the archive. So we can only delete source files from the vessel if we know that we will never need them when we are out of connection. So there's rules for what folders I list, and I think I have alluded to this with the naming conventions of my spacecraft, uh, which I haven't shown yet. Um, basically, there will be a place to find modules that anybody can use, a global library. And then the idea is that we have uh, base configurations of the rockets. And each one of those, each class, each vessel class, might have uh, customized things. For instance, uh, uh, some vessels might have interesting constraints around how to deploy solar panels or something. I don't know. Uh, but those would be common to all the launches. There might be 10 launches of a given thing. Like Think of the, the Apollo missions. We had unmanned Apollos, we had manned Apollos that went up and went around the moon, we had Apollos that did landings and so on. So each mission had its own profile, but there's a lot of commonality between them. So you've got the place to put the stuff that's common to all missions with the same vehicle class, and then a place to put the stuff for this particular launch. So there's a short list of folders, one for the mission, one for the class, and one for the common. So we're going to look at all those places. Uh, so now, did I say this? Uh, oh, it doesn't, I don't think I recorded what they're supposed to do. Once we've found the source, compiled it, we copy it, we run it. That's during, that's inside the import. When you run the module, it needs to do an export call to inform the system of what object to return to get access to the, uh, the, the services. I've toyed with the idea of having the import method itself create a lex and pass it to the module. That would mean all the modules would have a parameter when they start, which would be the lex to fill in, and they would fill it in. And that's cool and everything, but I'm admitting to myself right now that some modules, the entire module may be a single function. So instead of returning a lex, you may simply be returning a function. So then the question becomes, what happens to a module for which there is no source? I'd say that's an error. If you're trying to load a module and you're connected to the archive and there is no such source, or you're disconnected and the source is not on board. But that's a software engineering error. It's a programming error. So at that point, I'm going to let the, the microcode crash and I will see if I can figure out a way to maybe cause the terminal to pop up or something. Uh, not sure. We, we may need a, a panic call, we explicitly call. For now, I am going to let KOS itself declare the crash by, by saying, well, you're accessing something in Alex that's not there. So we're going to keep it simple for now. So let's go back to Farcos and look, look at import and export. 
export first. So the module is going to say export something. And I want to store that something where the import can get a hold of it. So if we've got the module name, which I'm going to acquire somehow, and here's how, we say module values add. So module values is going to be a, a lexicon. And we have to find that up at the top. Um, the reason why this is in the order it's in is because all of these locals uh, are variables. And these can be functions. Hold on. So import and export are globals. And these are actually not functions that are being defined. What I'm doing here is I am defining a variable in global scope, and I'm initializing it to a delegate for the function, the unnamed function defined here. So this braces, these, this defines unnamed function, and this assigns a delegate to the function to import. Now later on, we can call import just like a function. So this is actually the same thing as defining a global variable called a global function called import. It's just the type of the import is going to be a little different. Do that with import. And do that with export. And I'll do that up here at the top so it's more clear what's going on. But that does mean these need to be functions because we're going to be doing forward references for them. And because it's a function declaration, I don't need a dot at the end. There. So now we can do forward references to get things. So we have... I'm thinking that starting with export wasn't a good idea. So import and export are going to work together to... Uh, allocate space in a list, in a lexicon here. You know, well, not allocate, but decide on, on how to store it and store something in there. So when we import, we're going to, well, first of all, say if we already know what the object is, let's just return it. So if, if module name has been imported, then return module values of module name. The module values is a lexicon. Imported will be my way of testing to see if it's in the lexicon because we do it several times and I wanted to make that coding clearer than saying a much longer expression. It actually looks like this. Module values has key module name. So rather than seeing this, we can just say if we've already imported module name do that. So our import, as discussed, we try to copy it from somewhere in the path, and then we try to import from the local source file. Actually, this is not a source file anymore. So we're going to try to import the module from the local storage. And then we're going to return. Now, if try import from local, at some point in here, if it doesn't call export, we're going to get an error there. That's fine. That's the engineering error I was talking about. So this means that try import from local needs to catch a value sent by export. And in export, um, now I don't like dealing directly with the stack. Make a function for this. Okay, so we are going to get the name of the module being imported and add the value. So somebody calls export with a value. We're going to find the name. We're going to make an entry in the in the, uh, in the module list. That's great. Utility for module B imported name, which we pop it off of the stack. Here's our are we that. 
Okay, so now we get into the meat of try copy and try import. We'll try copy. Let's do a try import first, since we're talking about the stack. Um, it's called with a module name. I am going to invert this logic. Try import from local is given a module name. If the module name exists as a program locally, probably in KSM form, we're going to push the name of it onto this stack, the stack we looked at above, and we are going to run it. Now inside this run it's going to call export, which is going to pop. So we pushed here, it's going to pop. If it doesn't put if it doesn't pop, we're not going to get a value for it, yada yada. Again, we're going to be a little fragile on errors here, at least in the beginning. I'm not going to spend the time to go through every possible error condition and work it out, because that would make this video five hours long. And it's already 20 minutes when you haven't even built a ship yet. Anyway, so there is import and export. So if we import a module, it exports it. Import catches what it's sending and sends it back. There's Farcos. The other thing I need is a module called Go. Let's build a module called Go in P. P is where we put our shared stuff. So Go is going to be the module that is called for every mission that doesn't have a Go file thing. Um, you know, I'm going to go change something. Go is not going to return a lex. It's going to return a... a oh, <laughs> oh, that looks weird. Well, no, let's do this. When I import the Go module, it's just going to return a raw function de delegate. So what we can do here now is I can say export this. And this is just a function delegate for the code I want to run. So what I want to do is I want to print something when I load it and I want to print something else when I actually run it. So we're going to see that it loads it and runs it separately. And back at boot, so I've got something, I've got a message here that says, oh, we terminated. So in theory, this should all work. Let's go build a ship. Here's the ship that I've been tinkering with. Uh, it is Farcos-A configuration, flight number one. And if we look at this, we see that it has, well, let's set up a boot file for it. Uh, I'm going to make sure that it's read the boot folder. So it will run the boot file. It's got a huge amount of disk space because it's it's using that development sideband that I set up. Uh, we probably don't have a lot of electricity, so we'll just see what happens here. So our actual mission at this point is going to be to go out and pick up, uh, gather science data, and launch a vessel. So I think. I'm not sure what triggers launch the vessel, but we'll worry about that when we get out there. Boop. This may be enough to cause it to, to say that I've launched. Okay. You see I've got MechJeb set up, and I just heard a little blip saying somebody had an error. So let's take a look here. Open terminal.
that type is awfully small. Uh, choose font. Let's see, what font do we want to use here? Um, it's a good solid font, but I want it to be larger. Default font size, that's supposedly, oops, close. That's supposedly font size 12. Open terminal. Uh, that's not changing the size of the font. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's 20 point. Uh, I hope that's big enough. Let's set that to the default here. So, uh, get suffix go not found in user delegate, blah de blah. This is in boot.ks because boot.ks still was using import go colon go, which means that it didn't load up the new boot file, probably because I forgot to save it. Let's see here. Well, that's correct. It doesn't look like it wasn't saved. Let's go back to vehicle assembly. And we go into KOS and reread the boot folder. Boot.ks. Unfortunately, I can't do my programming in here. I have to go out there. So, let's see if this worked. I'm going to go ahead and leave the source file up there. <clears throat> I'm not hearing a bleep. Open terminal. And there it is. So we have printed Farcos version 1.1.0 and loading Pico and running Go from P and software control terminated. So that's good. I can remove those prints now. I'm going to leave the one for control software terminated because that's going to be something I want to notice in real missions when it happens. But go.ks. So what I want here is a warning that there's no vehicle, no flight software found for a configured I'm just going to do that print. Now inside Farcos, did I have any prints? I don't think I had any prints. Nope. Now this did do some compilations. So let's take a look at what we got. So on the vessel, we did get Farcos.ks and Go.ksm. So Farcos did not get compiled to KSM form. So I thought I had done that. So let's do that. See if that works better. Toggle power. So it still didn't create Farcos.ksm. But it did compile it on the other side, which means that for some reason it's not copying Farcos.ksm from the archive to the vehicle. OK, and this is in slash boot. So we need to go back to vehicle assembly to 
pick up the new version that explicitly says copy path to the KSM file. So, now we've got the Fargo.ksm file. Something useful to notice here is that the source file was packed, packed down from 1500 bytes to 1150 bytes, even though there wasn't a whole lot of wastage in there. Uh, I'm not sure how to list stuff in a subdirectory, but if we look in my Visual Studio over here, oh, <laughs> and it doesn't show me sizes on these. Um, let's see if I can bring up an Emacs on that. Okay, there's an Emacs editor. And what I wanted to note here was that go.ks is so small that it actually compiles to something bigger than it was. So compiling isn't always going to make things smaller. Hopefully it will make really big files a lot smaller. Otherwise, you know, if it doesn't, we can just turn it off. Let's turn that off here. So, let's see, we are, well, we're really playing Kerbal Space Program too, so I need to actually uh, get some science done real quick. Observe the mystery goo and get a crew report and have Jebediah grab an EVA report. Now, I could probably walk around and collect more EVA reports, but I think that's actually not necessary. And recover vessel. So for KOS, <clears throat> we're going to want the swivel engine fairly soon, but we need more science quickly, so research that. And not enough science left to do anything else. continue with Farco's A1. Uh, this time I'm going to add a thermometer. So we can get a temperature reading out there on the, on the launch pad. And let's see, what have we got here? We've got a solid rocket booster. We've got a coupler. Oh heck, let's go ahead and build something that actually launches. Okay, so I am going to need a little more than this. I'm going to want to pick up some science from the ground and in the air and from where I landed. And that's going to be three thermal readings. I already have a goo reading from the launch pad, so I only need two goo. So put those here. Two more thermometers. Okay, so 
<coughs> next step is we've got a parachute we want to put an engine on this and I'm going to want a stage between the between us and the engine because I am I am going to go to Lux on this decoupler and our only engine is this so if I just do this I'm going to have trouble uh, do I have some aerodynamics what have I got here I have some aerodynamics. I like using three-way symmetry. A little stubby trash can of a, of a spacecraft. Uh, we're going to send either Jeb or Valentina up in this. We don't need to have a radio. We have all the sides we want. They're going to be carrying their own of these, I believe. They start off with a shoot in a backpack. I'm not sure. So now the question is, do I want to make this entire flight completely automatic? Well, first off, let's make this Fargo's B slash 1. A configuration had no engines. So this is Farkus B. And my plan is I'm going to uh, stage to launch this thing up. It's going to go straight up. And then it's going to separate. Once the engine is done, it's going to stage. And capsule will then continue upwards, peak, come back down, and we're going to pop the chute. So, um, it's not worthwhile to completely derail this whole thing and go off and build the mission control system, but I'm going to make a go file specifically for this guy. So inside N we need a new folder called Farcos b and inside there we need a new folder called one and inside there we need a file called go.ks and it's going to export the code for this flight I'm going to be running around like a madman trying to do all the science manually. Uh, there should be a way for me to wait for us to stage. In fact, I know there's a way of doing that because I do it. Let's see here. I'm going to bring up my launch, ad launch script and just copy right out of it. change that. So when I hit stage, that's going to fire the engines. Now I think what I want to do is I want to turn and head east. So once we actually get some steam up, once we're, we're going upwards at 10 meters per second, we'll continue onward with this. Um, the 
trick I want to do now is I want to actually use a variable for my steering. So CS is command steer. So initially set CS to heading and this is going to be the azimuth which is initially going to be zero and pitch is 90. In fact Lock CS to facing says whatever whatever my attitude is when we start the script. Lock the steering to maintain that. And then down here I'm going to say set CS to so we're going to rotate to 90 degrees. So this is going to face us east. This really just means that when we when we pitch over to the east, uh, we'll be upright rather than upside down. We could do a space shuttle thing where we're upside down, but that's that's for other cool things. Okay, so now uh, I'm gonna wait a few seconds to get a you know so we get get our heading pointed that way. And then we're gonna tip over. out of thrust, I'm going to stage again, which will decouple the spacecraft. At this stage, we will be continuing on upwards. So there's a vertical speed. Let me check another one here. speed is negative, and then we're going to wait for us to get down below 2,000 meters, then we're going to wait until... Um, what is my ship velocity magnitude? everything. And I am going to try that right off. So this is in Farcos B. Um, should be in B slash 1. Yes. And Farcos B 1 go chaos.
any bets on whether this works the first time? Nah, never. Uh, let's send Valentina up. If everything worked, it should be sitting there waiting for me to press spacebar. Now, mind you, I'm going to have to jump around doing science while this is flying. Yes, press spacebar to launch. Oh, I need to make sure when you bring this up, if I just hit spacebar, it'll be input. So I need to click outside there so this isn't highlighted. So we need to start by getting the temperature here. We're going to want to get this guy and this guy in flight. And these guys we're going to want to get when we, when we splash down. Hopefully, we will be tilting over far enough so that we actually splash down. And we have an error. Suffix radar not found on object value which means that in go.ksm line, line 18, here, altitude is just altitude. <clears throat> Let's revert to flight. So I thought altitude It was a radar altitude. Oh well, let's see if this works. This is the Kerbal way of development. You just kind of try things, and if it fails, you try again in a different way. So there's the experiments I'm going to fire off while we're in the air. <clears throat> and I might as well queue up the other ones too. Oops, cancel. There we go. Launch. Rotate. ran out of fuel before we pitched over. I think that happened pretty fast. I'm going to decrease our altitude to 250. And I think I am going to wait on the so we're going to wait until we actually hit our maximum altitude before we jettison our socket, solid rocket booster there it just make it easier for me to follow along so we need to actually toggle the power here to make sure that we load up the right go And actually, I'm not just going to keep doing trial runs. I'm not going to worry about the science until I've got a good run. And then I'll do it with the science. That's not much of a pitch over. So going to pitch over at a much lower altitude. Okay, that stage at the right time. Oh, we may have, we may have done okay. 
went nice and high. Oh, the other thing is I need to turn off my steering at some point. <laughs> yeah, okay, so at this point I'm going to... Put ourselves up again. So altitude less than two thousand, it should pop the chute. Twenty-two, twenty-one, twenty, and we had an error. Magnitude not found on vector. Well, that's because it's not magnitude, it's just mag. And actually for this ship, I don't really need to worry about my, my speed. Okay, so now we revert to launch. At this time I'm gonna do science because of course it's gonna work. Keep. Pop you up for later. Pop you up for touchdown. And spacebar for launch. do we get? Do we break 10,000 meters? <laughs> 84.35-ish. Okay, so observe the goo. Keep. Log the temperature. Keep. So I can turn on our stability augmentation system and have Valentina keep us pointed. There. Now we've got enough aerodynamics that we should be fairly stable. These little capsules do a decent job. forgot we should get a crew report Okay, parachutes are very slow. Yeah, 
And let's get DVA report. Round it all off. So there we have it, two vessels, and we already have one that I used an autopilot on, even if it was, um, well, not well designed. And that got us some science. So spend it. Got 42 left, so we can get two out of the three at the next layer. Survivability gets us more science, so we're going to go with that. They have a choice of either decoupler and winglet and nose cone or a stronger engine, solid rock boosters, and a fuel tank. I'm going to go with this one because I can build more interesting rockets with a fuel tank. We will want the stability soon though. Oh, that's radial. Yeah, coming soon. Okay, so at this point, um, we have cobbled together Farcos B microcode. This is the equivalent of hand coded machine code on the first Apollo. What I want to do now is do a rocket that can actually follow an ascent path, and we'll pick up an ascent module that I have worked on in the past and get that going. So, Farcos C. This may be the first design where we actually get multiple launches with differing missions out of it. Normally, we're going to do some science. Uh, I'm only going to put one on. I'm going to go somewhere, do some science, and come home. because we have a Kerbal on site, although this might, but if we reboot it, it would allow us to contact the archive. We haven't written any of the code for that yet. So, I'm going to give us a heat shield. So, this is all that's going to be re-entering from wherever we are. I'm optimistic that we will be taking this class of ships up high enough that we'll need a heat shield. Ground aerodynamics, payload. Oh, we could tuck all of our science in a service bay. That would be kind of cool. Yes, we do. So when we land, I want to make sure. 
sure I don't crush the service bay. SRBs on the side, and I want a little teeny engine. So we can come back with a little teeny engine to do our deorbit. That'll give us a, a lot more flexibility. Essentially, SRBs on a two stage rocket gets you a lot of things. There's Farco C1, 21 parts out of 30, about 10 tons out of 18. So it's doing pretty good. Uh, we don't have any way of stabilizing this on the landing pad. So now let's take a look at the new folder. Uh, hold on. How do I get that to go under N? File Explorer, which allows me to use Windows to do the moving. There we go. So Farco C. There's the Farco B microcode. We're going to do a new file. So for this guy, I, I want to actually spend a little time to build something bigger more useful. There's a couple things I want to import right off. 
Uh, one of them is going to be a little bit of magic, which will keep us from having to do a lot of headaches. This is... This is called set stage. Let me grab it. I need to make sure this is good for our current microcode. So, let's see. First of all, I import Farcos because there's some things in Farcos I want to use. And what are those things? Here I have ST, which stores a file to the ground archive. So I need to make sure that Farcos is providing that. have an ST module. <clears throat> but here's what ST does. It takes a data file and it wants to copy it up into dollar home. Farcos itself is not really imported with import uh, because it's not actually a module, but it fakes it. I can fake it up as a module. So, what I can do here is to say, set stage does is it collects information about the spacecraft by going down through the, the spacecraft is represented in KOS as a tree of nodes. So we recursively descend through this tree looking at things, looking for parachutes and decouplers and engines and knowing where they are and which ones affect the other ones, we can construct a, another Kerbo script which is a auto stager, <clears throat> and then we can load it. You notice that I am going to create it here, and somewhere else I'm going to load it. But the key thing is that it's doing this thing right here. It's turning off the warp, the time warp. It's waiting until we can stage, and then it's staging. It's doing that at exactly the right time many things. This, as they say, just works. That's the first of the big things I want to import. The other thing I want to import is an ascension, I would say launch, actually three things I want to import. Next thing is launch. module whose entire job is to handle launching us. And again, it wants Farcos. It imports set stage. So 
so that whatever export from set stage will be what it imports. And where's my export statement? module set stage, along with doing its job, exports a, a package which has three lists and a go function. The go function is what actually looks at the spacecraft and makes all the work. So the first time we run it, we set all this up, the second and when we call go, it writes out the file. And it also has these lists which it fills in. I wasn't going to go through this, but the next little bit is here when we here's the where we're writing out the file. When we run the file, it's getting a parameter coming in, which is the set stage module. So that's where it is. And it can pick up that state and use it. So we have code setting up state that's passing to code that it generated. launch, again, imports Farcos, it wants something called EV out of Farcos, let's make sure that's set up. And indeed it is not. The purpose of EV is to log a message of some sort, log an event. And we don't really have uh, much in the way of events yet. So for now, we're just going to put it on the screen. Let me find my reference for that. The way you do that is with HUD text. And HUD text has a bunch of parameters that do interesting things. But for now, just going to do that. I have forgotten what all those things do, but this makes nice white messages up here in top dead center of the screen in a reasonable size font. And it looks good. Um, obviously, at some point later on, a, a vessel or a vessel class could reach in and change the EV entry in this Lex. Yes, the lexes that are in the module values represent the modules are not read-only. They are not immutable, so you can reach in and change the implementation of another class's entry points. Uh, yikes, but okay. It does allow us to, over, to, to uh, override functions, which is good. So there's EV. Now let's go back to launch. So we, we get set stage imported and then we delete it. And what I want to do is I want to make sure I delete that KSM because import is going to compile it. Like that. <clears throat> this means that set stage itself will not be retained on the vehicle. This is okay because we will never use it after we launch. So, scan down here, this is where we actually use SSGO, we'll write the file called auto stage, and it writes it locally and uploads it to the archive. And then we're going to run path it, which is going to run auto stage.ks, and we're going to pass in the set stage module. So auto stage doesn't have to know the name to import for set stage. That's kind of important. And then we're going to delete it. So autostage.cast won't stick around on the vehicle. So we have two files here that we copy to the copy to the vessel, loaded, and deleted. And launch will continue until we reach 100 meters per second surface velocity. So that's that's just enough to get us clear of the gantry. Well, 
we want to do more than that. Let's grab the Ascend script. And that's imported. Now Ascend is written to a different standard of operation. Notice it's starting off, the first thing it says is exporting, and it's exporting a function delegate, not a, not a lex. This may be how I want to do most of my launch phases. Did I do launch this way? Yeah, I did launch this way too. So, launch and ascend, when you load the module, what you're getting back isn't a lex, it's just a function delegate that you're going to call. some documentation here on how to use it and what I'm going to do with it. Um, the original numbers here, uh, if you have been doing KOS for a while, you're probably aware of Cheers Kevin, who worked out some nice closed form numbers for a reasonably good, almost well, possibly optimal uh, gravity turn. And I've modified those here, I've rounded them up, and I think I don't need to use all of five digits of precision. And I know that these numbers aren't optimal, but they're fairly good and they're nice and round. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to set my pitch altitude as I go up. I want to curve over and basically pitch out is going to go from zero to one as we approach the orbit altitude. And we're going to take the square root of that multiply that by 120, subtract it from 90, and then clip that. So that will be our pitch. So basically this is going to take us from vertical to horizontal, and we're going to get to horizontal uh, well before we reach orbital altitude. And that's going to be a nice smooth curve. And these numbers get tweaked to find stuff that works. It turns out that these numbers in the past worked for a wide variety of vessels. Yeah, there he uses EV. I think this actually can be used without modification. So let's go what we've got here. We've got launch, set stage, ascend, We've got our library Farcos, and we have our go.ks in Farcos C1. Whoops, that's in Farcos C. That should be in Farcos C1. Uh, I will have to fix that elsewhere. Now, the handling of folders in VS Code is I would call it cranky. There. So Farco C1, go KS. Farco B1 has nothing. Farco B has a go to KS. So all the Farco Bs would be there. We never built a Farco A directory. does go.ks look like? Not Fargo's B. Let's kill these. standard to import Farcos right at the top of these things. Notice I did that in Ascend and so on. That will import it. When we're being imported, it'll import it. So if I put a dependency at the top, it means that we pull in all of our dependencies the first time we get imported. So that's important. So it happens 
on the ground before we launch. So there's some flight phases we want to grab here. about Farcos Reutility, we know about Launch, we know about Ascend. And Launch is going to take care of uh, handling all of the set stage stuff. So now that we have set stage worked out, set stage means we don't need to worry about staging, and Launch means we don't need to worry about set stage anymore. Now Launch takes care of waiting for go. So we're just going to call Launch, and we, we want to launch azimuth. I'm going to say local. Now I can have us initially head any direction I want. Let's head 90 because that puts us out over the ocean. So when launch returns, we have cleared the gantry and now we want to ascend, which requires a launch azimuth orbit altitude. And I'm going to go to 72 kilometers. So what do we do when we get there? Um, ascend puts us on this path that I was describing. What I didn't say is when it stopped. Now, once it reaches here, so when the apoapsis of our orbit reaches our target altitude, it's going to turn off the engines and it's going to put up a Miko message, main engine cutoff, and basically shut everything down. Just leave us kind of coasting. So, now we want a stage of the orbit that is coast up. This is called Coast U. small source files that do a specific phase of flight. So again, we import Fargos, because everybody needs Fargos. We have a margin, so we're going to coast upward to Apoapsis with some margin. So, let's see. Basically, we're going to lock our steering and throttle to known things, which is hold this pointing prograde and throttle off, RCS off, and we're going to wait until we're within margin seconds of apoapsis, or we're coming back down. So if we have passed apoapsis when we call Coast U, it returns immediately. It doesn't wait for you to go an entire orbit around. And once we've got there, uh, the rest of this is all just putting some events on the screen. So a little bit of work and a little bit of stuff on the on the text console. But the text is something I have to bring up. Well, let's do the let's do the uh, the coast U first, and then we'll think about how am I going to see that text. up until we are, oh, let's say 60 seconds from Apoapsis. Oh, well, let's make it 30. So when we get there, we'll be 30 seconds from it, and we'll have our, our, our vessel's going to be pointed prograde, and we're going to be ready to do something. Uh, I'm thinking, try to circularize the orbit. Why not? Now, 
Furco C1 probably won't get there. In fact, it is quite likely that we will run out of fuel during the ascent. And when we do, we are going to stage. Now, I do not remember whether the auto stager will automatically deploy the parachute or not. So, I'm going to terminate the source co the code here. So, if we get to where we're actually approaching the um, the apoapsis, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stage. And on the very very tiny chance that our, that we still have fuel, well, I've staged twice. What is the safe staging we were using? Ba -da -bum, ba -da -bum. I should have a subroutine to do this, but I don't, so we'll just do this. Wait until stage ready. Stage. This is kind of a stub, so let's make it clear what's going on. never staged at all. We, we might have our rocket with some fuel left in it uh, coming up on our apoapsis. We're going to stage once, which will leave us with just the re-entry thing, and then we're going to stage again. And at this point, that activates the gear and we have already deployed the parachute out and then I'm going to extend our landing gear and then wait until the end of the world. Nope, I'm going to terminate. The other thing we wanted to do was be able to see what's going on. So last thing, I promise, term. Term is a package that does one thing opens the terminal and it clears the screen and I am going to comment out the clear screen for now because I want to be able to see what happened before the term was used and we're going to call that up first a height parameter and a width parameter which it has defaults for so it's default to 16 lines you can set any number you want and the width is going to default to 64 columns you can set any number you want but 16 by 64 uh, I thought was appropriate for a, a Kerbal, Kerbal quality spacecraft so we just wrote a whole bunch of code here I mean, a lot of code what's chances it'll work probably not Who's flying this mess? Jeb, you're out. Let's put Valentina on this one. 
So science is in the service bay, and we'll collect the science up in the air. Of course, we're not going to get any reward unless we recover the vessel. Uh, and the chances of this one soft landing, well, I don't know, it might, it might, it might. We've actually got stuff here. This could soft land us. So let's go ahead and do a save first, and then we're going to launch. Fargo C1. Should be a three second pause, and it should open the terminal and prompt me to go ahead and hit the button. Okay. Oh, I know what the matter is. I think I forgot to set the... <laughs> yeah, I forgot to tell it to use the boot volume, but to use boot. Let's revert to vehicle assembly. Very important boot file, boot.ks. Save, launch. And I heard a blip that there was an error. So what have we got here? Key not present in the directory at Farcos line 36. Ah, so boot.ks called farcos.ksm, called farcos.ksm, called go.ksm called farcos.ksm, so go is importing something that doesn't exist. Term, let's see. Term.ks, oh, term.ks isn't under P, it's in the wrong place. There we go. So term, Let's just double check. Farcos is a stock import. Actually, Farcos is a built in term launch send goes to you. Term launch send goes to you. Wish I could tell this VS Code to not show me KSM files. Uh, nope, probably not. Okay. Hide VS Code and go over here and hit toggle power. Badonk. Oh, another error. Career paradigm. Uh, something that I had to scroll back to. Okay, so need a bigger terminal. So 66 lines by 96 columns. How big is this? Uh, okay, oh, there it is down at the bottom, 87. That's 80 by 50, actually. Talk about power. So I'm doing something that the career system isn't letting me do. 
you need a better vehicle assembly building or a space plane hangar in order for us to do action. So term.ksm line 6, I can't do that. So we cannot do a do action open terminal and that's an error. Uh, I think I have some code that checks to see whether that's allowed or not. Let me see if I can find it. Let's go back to my ancient, ancient code. Yeah, there it is. So this says if career can do actions. What this means is that I have to upgrade my assembly building before I can actually automatically open this terminal. That's too bad. I wonder if I can do that. What does it take? So it's going to cost me 225 funds to upgrade this guy. Uh, that's a while in the future, so we're just going to have to bite the bullet and open the terminal manually. if I remember to save my changes. Okay, so we're ready to launch. <clears throat> Let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, so undefined variable name, copy file, Farcos line, line 15, There's all the KSM files popping up here. That's good. Oh, it's not copy file. It's copy path. Revert flight to launch. Such a rookie, uh, such a bloody rookie. <laughs> Notice what happened when it staged the first time. <laughs> I haven't done that in 10 years. Okay, the other thing I'm noticing is I forgot to put in habit <clears throat> to set this up so it's actually an engine to have the, the couplers separate in separate stages. Um, in this case I think you have to, otherwise you end up popping the chute when you open the coupler. Did I hit spacebar more than once? I might have. Well, let's save that and try again. So when I said I was a rookie, I thought maybe I'd put the parachute in the same staging, but it shouldn't be staging yet. So there's our push go to launcher notification. 
I'm going to go ahead and open the terminal. so much better response out of it than we were out of the, the solid rocket booster. So you notice we're spooking to get shockwaves off of here as our speed goes up. I'm not sure what the speed of sound is on Kirby. So that's interesting. Uh, I'm going to write down how much fuel or how much delta V we started with. This is going to be interesting to know. Earth flight to launch. So inside Farco C, I want to do a new file. Let's start a mission log file. So I have logged how much delta V we have available. <clears throat> sixty eight point three eight KN thrust six TWR eighty eight second. Can I get the mass of the vehicle? Let's see, what else can I log here? Big Jeb has a bunch of interesting things it logs. So let's see, total delta V. So 2339 atmospheric, 2986 uh, vacuum. <clears throat> Live SLT. Not sure what SLT means. Oh, right. Zero out or live, right? Okay, vessel info is what I was looking for. Uh, Delta V stats we can toss down here. So, vessel mass is 9.775 tons. doesn't fill in the thrust weight ratio because I haven't fired the engines yet. And we open a terminal. And here we go. 
So now I will know how much delta V I need to take this rocket configuration up to that apoapsis. That doesn't include the circularization. trying to, to guide us up this, this curve and not being sure whether I'm going to be hitting the curve right on or not. Um, much more dependent on my skill as an engineer than on my personal skill as a pilot. And yeah, uh, at higher research levels, I can have you know, Bekjeb fly the, the ascent and all of that. But frankly, uh, I would rather write the code myself because I'm just that kind of guy. So we're coasting up. Uh, delta V shouldn't be changing. We have 384 meters per second left. So just rough numbers. This is kind of crossing up uh, delta V available at surface versus on orbit. So I'm going to say budget two two thousand views per second dv for ascent to space now i think that rockets that have different aerodynamic properties are going to increase that number but that's a good start. It gives us an order of magnitude, and I haven't played in such a long time. I wasn't sure whether that was 1,000 or 5,000. So now we have got to our normal spot where we would be circularizing. We were 30 seconds away from our apoapsis. Uh, and now we're just going to fall back. Now, are we attempting to control our attitude? I'm interested in just seeing what happens with the rest of this script. So we have electric charge. And we're using it. Oh, as long as we're in space. We just left space. We'll have to repeat this and take some numbers in space too. So we observe the mystery goo and we log the temperature and we log the pressure. And we take a crew report. Oh, come on. Now, we can't EVA yet. We have to upgrade the, uh, the crew, uh, crew area to do that. Oh, 
Also, I think I can reduce the size of the terminal again. at this point, because we burned off all that fuel, our mass was down to 4.2 tons, and our thrust weight ratio is up to 5, so, uh, yeah. Heating, we are using our fins. I'm going to revert the flight to the vehicle assembly building. Then go back to our microcode. So I should be able to look at how much fuel I have. Let me look that up. Disable that, and I'm going to say uh, lock steering to retrograde. So I probably should slow down. So I'm not sure whether this... Uh, and I'm going to let the auto stager handle staging for me. <clears throat>
carry enough fuel to successfully circularize and then break our orbit and land, not land, but parachute down without going over the limits. Um, it's probably a way to do it, but I need to get more science before I can do that. And that'll be a different ship configuration. So we're just going to go grab some high altitude science and some space science. I figure a couple, three flights of this configuration to get science. Uh, if this works, I'll just do those without recording and we'll see what's up. shield on there. I guess I have a heat shield. Good. See, I want to get that heat shield facing the right way, too. Now, if it turns out that our legs burn off before we hit, I will go ahead and get rid of those and not have them giving me drag. But I do want to collect the space science. Come on. So you notice over here, our monitors, we had main engine cut off at 27.6 kilometers. Uh, larger vessels, I see that as high as 40 or 45 kilometers. That low really means we have a much higher thrust to weight ratio than we really wanted. Okay, well, there's an error. Liquid fuel is not a thing. Okay, it's ship cone liquid fuel. Got it. Should have tested that earlier. Wait a minute, if I am busting my thr thrust to weight ratio, maybe, let's see here, let's try packing in some more fuel. In fact, yeah, let's do this. I'm feeling gutsy.
It's going to be completely orbital. Let's not do that. stage on the way up. So this is going to handle the last of our ascent, the circularization, and coming back down. Oh, uh, yeah. I know this video is going long, but let's try this. I'm going to see if I can take this orbit curve and Escape the atmosphere. I've already, I've already done escape the atmosphere, really, but I didn't have the, the uh, contract. That'll get me some money. Okay. So now we need to get serious. I need to set up a program to circularize and then deorbit. Let's get out on the launch pad where I can tinker. just in case I need to look for information. So the next thing we, uh, we do after we coast up is I'm going to circularize, which means I need to have my circularization script. This is, this is one I had a lot of fun building back in the day. importing this from the ancient sources, which means I need to manually adjust it for modern day stuff. Where'd Circ go? Here's my old original packaging, which gets changed. So export, and we're just going to export the method itself to circularize. So lots of comments on how I'm doing it. And we got parameters, throttle gain, Max facing error and good enough. And what this is going to do <clears throat> is it actually is not a loop, it is a circularization step, which means this isn't the one I want to export. This is circ step. The way you use it is something like this. So let's correct that for how I'm going to use circ step. So 
it down here. I'm going to do a circ that takes all of those and also takes a period, which is our real-time loop period. So I'm going to pass all of those decisions onto my caller. As per the example, we're going to start by holding our current facing with zero throttle. And then we're going to call circ step over and over and over again. And we're going to wait period. So we import local What do we want to what do we want display events for? because it's a screen message comes up here and it can't be very long before it wraps around so let's just do that
Okay, there's circularization. So now we go back to Fargo C go.ks and we circularize with those parameters. So circ actually gave us an event when it was done, so we don't need to. Oh, so now we want a descent done a descent script for this guy. So what we're going to do for descent, we're going to lock steering to retrograde, lock throttle to one, wait till we're completely out of fuel, lock throttle to zero, just do the rest of this normally. And we no longer have gear. Let's see what happens. Wobbly boy. I hope it works. saw an option to set the uh, craft to be more rigid. Apparently I imagined it. So see our TWR, TWR is already back up to two and a half. Should have got new numbers for the new ship. Hold on, let me get that. Okay, so 
new mission, new notes. Stage four, one, five, nine, eight meters per second. Stage two, one, one, nine, seven meters per second. Total, uh, get the delta V stats out over there. Uh, total delta V is two, seven, nine, four. is actually 3,600 meters per second if I was in vacuum. <coughs> some of this is in atmosphere, some is in vacuum, so the numbers are going to be kind of wonky. We're starting off with a thrust weight ratio of 1.17, which explains why we're such slow takeoff, but that's kind of a normal number actually. Yeah, so we're getting up into maximum fuel load range here. Now I should be able to get the time warp. <laughs> yeah, the pool noodle doesn't do too well, but... That's not too bad. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, time warp uh, it, you know, exacerbates things like that. OK, 
Okay, just check the manual. I don't think KOS supports a speed of sound information. Okay, uh, web hits I'm seeing is that the speed of sound is roughly 340 meters per second, but KSP doesn't model anything. Okay, that's pretty consistent. So we're just seeing interaction between the atmospheric pressure and the velocity causing heating. Oh, wait a minute. That was old stuff. Let's see. More recent comments. Undefined variable name circ go.ksm line 17. Oh, that's too bad. Well, that's because I forgot to import it. Anything else I want to change here? I think that's good. Mr. Limes. Uh, circ. Because this requires a dot. Because this is not a function definition, it is a assignment which requires a dot at the end. There we go. Doggle power. Close all that stuff up. And <clears throat> I'll pop up a mission log once we get on orbit and get some numbers into it.
So our stage two has 672 meters per second and is currently at a TWR of 5.54. The question is, is 672 meters per second enough to circularize? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't think I can use a... Nope. I was going to place a maneuver node, but you can't do that yet. I need upgrades. Okay, gonna hit these real quick once we get to a decent altitude. So we got our science, just need to return with it. Oh, Valentina. <laughs> you have zero fuel, and your periapsis is 35 kilometers. circularization is complete but the circularizations uh, script does not terminate if you're completely out of fuel Ooh, that's a hole let's fix that so basically if I want circ step to return true if we are completely out of fuel everywhere on the ship. But at this stage, hold on, if we ran ourselves out of fuel here, shouldn't it have staged it out? Oh, it didn't stage it because we have no more fuel to go with afterwards. So yeah, so the last stage we don't stage to discard the last liquid tank when it goes away because we may not have a... Uh, it, it may all be one thing. We may be landing with an empty engine. But we can't tell Cirque to stop when we run out of fuel. So let's see. I want total liquid fuel, not liquid fuel in this thing. So inside here, uh, we can even do that fairly early on. Now our 
thrust will drop to zero momentarily while we are staging. So we do want this to be total fuel available to us. We'll just fold that in here. Let's see. KOS documentation. I'm going to look this up real quick. Believe aggregate resources of some sort. Uh, no aggregate resources, the type. Hold on. How do I actually have fuel? <laughs> okay, so that blew the last little bit of fuel out. So ship coal and liquid fuel should be the aggregate. So it were ship. So we didn't draw it down to zero as we were burning, but it wasn't able to get any more thrust out of it. So I'm going to set this threshold to a hundredth of a, of a unit. Okay, if we do that, with that change, we should now terminate and go ahead and let it drop. At two and a half hours in, we're making one more try. guys set up. Because I am optimistic about this run. So I've got the various pop-ups pulled out to the right. So we know we're going to get here, <clears throat> and we actually have no more fuel left when we come out of circ. So we are going to lock steering to retrograde, which is going to take forever to get there because that's going to be on the, uh, on the little front bit, like the capsule to get us turned, but it's going to take forever, but it'll get there. Wait until ship liquid fuel less than zero, but zero, not quite zero. So 
So if we had any thrust to do, we could do it here, but there we go. And these last stages, uh, one to get rid of the module and one to deploy the parachute. Got it. like we're using a, about 2100 meters per second to get this wobbly boy up to his uh, peak point. So I may manually stage once so that we can get ourselves turned back around before we uh, start re-entering. I'm figuring that Valentina has plenty of time to hit that stage button on the way down. Okay, coming up on 72,000. Let's do our observes. Okay, so circularization stopped burning but hasn't terminated the script. You 
Yeah, the circularization script wasn't written with the intent of uh, terminating early.